Um, we, uh, we've been looking at the subject of the, the middas, the qualities of the qualities or the emanations, if you like, that make up the spiritual world that we're exploring during these seven weeks, right? I'm sure you've been with us over the last uh, few weeks during these discussions, and if not, I'm sure you're aware of this idea that the seven weeks between Pesach and Shurus, which we're going through now, represent an exploration of the, an exploration, an experience of these seven elements that make up everything that the world is built on, in just as deep a sense as the fact that the physical world is made up of three dimensions, or to put it in more Jewish terms, seven elements, three dimensions, of course, each dimension is two has two aspects, right? You have forward and back, left and right, up and down, it's six of them. And the seventh is the fact that they're all dimensions of the same, the same entity. They really have seven elements, which is exactly what the week is, with Shabbos bonding them all together. All of the revealed world is based on these seven elements, as we've discussed many times before. It's also the reason why there are seven distinct colors in the spectrum. And it's also the reason, in fact, why the music that the music that we use, one of the scales, musical scales that we use, is a seven note scale, the octave is the same as the first of course, and therefore it is these seven elements that are building the reality that we, uh, we experience. And the tradition is that during these seven weeks we go through the 49, uh, the 49 elements which are in fact the seven elements of each of these seven perhaps dimensions, and that is, uh, that's what we do now. So, since we've come now to the end, tonight, of the, the week <coughs> that is uh, completed, completing today, the last day of the week of the inner building, not the uh, Lagba Omer, is in fact the, which is what Yesterday was the 33rd day, which is the fifth day of the fifth week, represents that entity or that energy which is the completion of inner building. That is what on the mystical level is the, the dimension of, of the seed being completed. When the tree produces a seed, the, 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 fifth, the fifth level, if you like, is where the seed itself is, is complete. The first, of course, of the seven is the point of beginning. The second is where that comes to some condensed reality, the female side. The third is the harmony between those. We've discussed these over the weeks. The fourth is where the thing moves out beyond itself. That's why it's named, the, 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 the name of it is, is Netzach. Netzach means moves towards eternity. The translation of that in practice is that where, where, where something that grows begins to project itself towards eternity, that's called seed. The secret of seed is the secret of movement towards eternity. That's what a seed is. The word for a seed in Hebrew is zera. That is the same numerical equivalent as the word zikaron, which means a memory. In fact, the word zachar, which in Hebrew means male, is the same as zachar, which is, a, which is a memory. And the idea, of course, is that the seed, before it's given to the female dimension, in which it's built into reality, is nothing other than a memory of the previous generation. That's all it is. That's the male function. It's to be that bridge between the, the bridge between the previous generation history, and bring down only a memory. A seed is only a memory of the past. A seed has nothing of, if you cut open a seed, you won't find a small tree. If you cut open an, an acorn, you don't see a small oak tree. All you have in there is a compressed essence that carries with it what the meaning of that. But it's enough to grow another oak tree with its own seeds, which grow its own trees. That's the secret of seed. It's bringing down that memory. That's the male function. Of course, the transition from one memory to the next, that happens in the woman. That's why, again, the same sources indicate that the building blocks of the world, the physical world, is built out of stones. But that's not just, not accidental. The word even in Hebrew, even, which means a, a stone, even masa in the stone that the builders rejected, it means the cornerstone, the stone on which everything is, even shusir, the stone on, on which the world was founded, if you like, in Shulayim. So the word even is made of two fused words in Hebrew, av and ben, which means father and son. 
fused into one and the word itself is female. Evan in Hebrew always takes a feminine. A deep secret in that. But also why the tablets of stone, the Luchas are Evan, we're moving towards Shvuas, now the receiving of the Torah, the tablets, tablets of stone. But that is the that is the beginning of expression of self. The fourth, the fourth dimension is where self moves out into the beginning of seed production. And just like the first element needs to have its bounds so that it is real in the world, the, f- the fourth one also does, and that's the fifth. The fifth is where the seed is completed. It's not just the beginning of a production, but it has its final form. And the fifth day of the fifth week is Lagba Omer. Lagba Omer is that day on which the fire can be lit. It's a day of rejoicing because when the when the inner reality has been built, once the seed, in other words, the secret is that when the seed is complete, the future is guaranteed. All you need from a complete seed is that it should be given correctly and built correctly. But it's already, when the seed of a child is formed, then it's already determined if the child will have blue eyes and how... All the features of the child are already laid down in the seed. That is already safe. Nothing can change that. The only thing is it now needs a mechanism of expression. And that's called a woman. The dimension of the female is the dimension that takes that spark and is able to build it, to build it into reality. Of course, you have nothing without that. But what you at least have before you begin that is the inner reality has been built. And therefore, Lagba Omer is the celebration of the day on which the inner reality is complete, the seed has been built. And therefore, Abshim Ba Yochai, who is the one who brings the hidden wisdom to the world, the inner heart of Torah, as opposed to its outer expression, that is what is celebrated on that day. So you have, you reach the point, in fact this week we just passed that point, where the first phase, namely the inner building is complete. I mean, it's no accident and I'm sure while we, while I've been talking you've already been calculating, I'm sure you're not sitting there passively. You, you're thinking, right? You've already been calculating that the fifth day of the fifth week is the 33rd day, right? Did I guessed right? You already calculated that the, the, the fifth day of the fifth week is the 33rd day. Is that right? And therefore, that's the idea. The 32 days that precede it are always, 32 in, in Torah is always the phase of inner building. Lamed Bet in Hebrew is lev, the heart. Ani yeshena velibi er. I, I am asleep but my heart is awake. Even when the outer expression is asleep, but the inner heart is never... The spark is always lit. And therefore... That is, for example, why you have 32 times the name of Hashem, the name Elohim, the name of formation or creation is mentioned in the description of the creation. It's always the, it's always the inner building. Why 32? Again, there's a lot to talk about here. 32 is because you always have the 10 mystical emanations and the 22 letters that bind them. 22 letters of the alphabet in Hebrew. These form the 22 plus the 10. This is known as the Lamed Bet Nesivas Chochma, or in the Kabbalistic writings it's called the Lamed Bet Nesivas Plias Chochma, which means the amazing or miraculous, marvelous, let's say, sparks of wisdom that build the world. These are the 32 elements. Actually, what's really being built here is an inner... You see, what's built inwardly that's re- that reflected outward is one's own... The word is Kavod. Kavod means genuine honor. I mean, today they're translated into words like uh, respect and self-respect and self-esteem and words like that, but kavod, kavod really means the point of, you know, the word kavod in Hebrew is the same as kaved, which means heavy. Because that's where the weight is, right? You know, it's very interesting in Hebrew, you can't do this in other languages, but in Hebrew the word for honor, genuine dignity is kavod, and it has the same root as kaved, which means heavy. The word for light in Hebrew, kal, is also the same root of the words meaning to be dishonored or to be to have no weight, to have no weight and no respect. To be, yeah. yeah. It's no accident, of course, that the word kaved, which means heavy, also means the liver. The liver is the first organ below the diaphragm, right? You have the three that we mentioned that are the roots above the pasta above the diaphragm, that's the essence of the self, and you move below the diaphragm, you move to maintenance and reproduction functions, which are extension of self, that's kaved, which means, of course, it's no accident that in English, right, English is almost always reliably the spiritual opposite of what it's supposed to be, right, because it's not Hebrew, but occasionally they get it right, and here's one example where they got it right, why do they call it the liver, 
because that's where the life force is concentrated that's where the blood is heavily concentrated and but that's where it is the idea of inner respect of an inner content a genuine dignity the inner being the lave yeah, that's called kavod and of course kavod adds up to 32 right Chaf Bet is 22, and Vav Dalad is 10. Exactly those 22 elements and the 10 elements, that's exactly what's being built. And of course, that's why the students of Rabbi Akiva, they died in these 32 days, because on those 32 days, they didn't give each other the correct manifestation. At their incredible level of purity and spirituality, the incredibly sh- perfect emanation of dignity that was meant to be given from one of us, e- each of us to the other, at a time of year when that is in- in- incredibly exactingly demanded, it cost them their lives. But it's the, same, it's the same issue. We're talking about a building of the inner world. Now, that's a brief review of the, of the, of the elements that have brought us to this point in the, in the counting. Let's now turn our attention to the next one, which is the week that we're entering. Or tomorrow, tomorrow wraps up the previous process and the day after brings us into that week. And that is called Midas Yisoyed. That is the sixth of the seven and that needs to be understood. It's a very difficult thing to talk about, but it's a. There's no way to avoid it because it is the problem of our, particularly the problem of our generation, the pre messianic problem. And that is the area of male female interaction. Male female relationship. <laughs> the whole area of marital connection, including, and especially perhaps intimacy, which makes it very difficult to talk about without transgressing exactly the point that we're trying to make, which is its purity. The more you expose these things, the more you fall into the hands of the forces that are the dark forces in this area, and therefore we have to speak in a, in a correct way about these things. Not that we are prudish at all. On the contrary, in the correct environment, in the correct time and place, that we can be, the Torah is extremely open, extremely open. I mean, our, our explicit sources, I mean, it's a remarkable feature of Torah learning, that it is... As, as incredibly explicit and, and, and open about these things it's, I've always, I've never ceased to marvel at the fact that you can step into Yeshiva and you can find 14 and 15 and 16 year old boys in the height of their adolescent passion really learning sources that I definitely would be too squeamish to mention, learning details of and learning it with the holiness of Torah learning it's a remarkable thing, it's the Kedusha of the Jewish people the sanctity of the Jewish people so we're certainly not prudish but it has to be done correctly the, the right time and place and but let's approach the subject as best we can and understand in its Torah depth at least what it means and why it is so almost incredibly perverted and, and literally prostituted in our generation and why that is so central. Let's see if we can begin to get an appreciation of this area. The main theme to try to understand here is how our Jewish perspective on this question is, is diametrically opposed to that of the world. I mean, we couldn't be more exactly what they see as beautiful, we see as offensive. And exactly that which these, they see as problematic, we see as beautiful. It's a remarkable subject. But it takes a radical shift of perspective from the world that you, you leave when you walk the street and you're faced with the posters and the billboards and the things that they rub in your face. It is a big shift in perspective to leave that world. So let's see if we can do that. This sixth mida, right, which is called Yesoid, which means, yeah, you can't translate these things. The, the translation in English is foundation, if that, if that helps in any way. Yesod. Tzadik Yesod Oilam. The, the righteous individual means the one who is in control of this area, this sensual area, is the foundation of the world. Let's try to understand that. First of all, what do we mean? What are we talking about? We're talking about the function here of bris. Bris, the circumcision, bris, the covenant. Bris in Hebrew means brit, it means a covenant, that's what it means. It means an inalienable covenant in which two are bonded into one. That is the concept here of covenant, of bris. You know, in Hebrew, a remarkable thing. In Hebrew, we once remarked on the paradox that when we talk about chesed, which is kindness, with the verb we use seems to be the wrong verb. Yeah, I mean, you remember we discussed that? We said that the Hebrew, the verb we use for kindness, we say goimel chesed. The word gomel in Hebrew does not mean giving, kindness. Gomel in Hebrew means to withhold and withdraw. Right? Literally, gomel means to wean. 
Vayigamal means the child was weaned. The mother stopped giving milk. <coughs> surely the giving of milk is an act of kindliness. And surely withholding it and leaving the child on his own, as it were, surely that is a withholding of... And yet the verb... You hear the paradox. The verb we use for giving of kindness is going milk. And we explain the reason is because the real kindness is to give the person the ability to detach. As long as you make the person attached... There is a, a one-directional kindness, and no doubt, of course, there is a giving, but there's a humiliation of making the person dependent. The real kindness, the real kindness, is when the child's given the ability to stand on his own feet, even though the mother has to give up the pleasure of, of being the one who nurtures at that point. Well, of course, a much deeper nurturing, you have to understand this in a mature way. But that is, called, that is the paradox of that verb. When you come to covenant, we use, also have a paradoxical verb. The, the verb that we use in sealing a covenant or forging a covenant, in Hebrew, you know, the English words again don't mean anything. In Hebrew, the word is kairis bris. Kairis means to cut. To cut, right? The verb we use for forging a bond, we talk about cutting. Lichrot in Hebrew means to, to cut, to cut down, to cut apart. <laughs> Do you hear the paradox? Why are we talking? The whole idea of bris is that two of us become one. Uh, uh, until death, if necessary. A covenant means that I won't let you down. Once we have a treaty, once we have a covenant, then if you need me, I'm there. Whether it's my responsibility or not, it is my responsibility. So why do we use a verb? You hear this problem. Why do we use the, the Torah verb that we use for sealing an inalienable, indissolvable bond between two? We use the verb that means cutting. So the Gaon of Vilna gives a classic, classic insight here. And he says, because the meaning of a covenant is almost inexpressible in its beauty, he says the meaning of bris is that two, two people who have this love that is sealed in a covenant that cannot be dissolved, the way they, the way they manifest that, the way they, they enact that, is each one cuts from himself something vital to himself and gives it to the other. Each one cuts away a part of himself, not just a part, a part that's vital, and leaves it with the other, in trust as it were. And that party cuts off something of himself that is vital and leaves it with me. That means wherever I am, apart from you, there's a vital part of you that I carry. And I'm vulnerable to the fact that you carry a vital part of me around with you. The whole concept of covenant is that it bonds us when we're apart. Yeah, there's no, when two people have become one, that's not, that's, there's not a treaty, that's just one. The idea of bris is that, yeah, is that there's a bond that, that bonds a distance. It brings together that which is not normally together. And therefore, this idea of bris is, is this mixing of essence. That's what we're talking about. So this is the this is the secret of the bond between man and wife, and it's called yesod. The person who symbolizes this, let's try to understand this more deeply. The person who stands for this in the world, the person who symbolizes this, is Joseph. Yosef, Yosef at Tzadik. It's why it's called Yosef at Tzadik. In fact, the word Yosef means to make more. We're talking about production of fruit here, about about birth, about bringing new life to the world, done correctly. Yeah, Yosef means to, to make more, to be more. Joseph is the one who most perfectly represents this, 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 this energy, if you like. And in order to understand that, we have to understand that he manifests two things. Right? Let's try and put our heads into this. not easy. He is the, the character who comes to the world. The sixth of these seven characters who bring these energies to the world. He is the one who manifests the purity of this area and he builds it. First of all, let, let, let's try and let's say the principle. The principle is that the Jewish notion of male-female bonding is that it is the most extremely beautiful thing that can be. Genuine beauty, what we call yofi. Yofi means beauty. And it's beautiful because it's loyal. Again, it's not beautiful because it's an exposure of this area. On the contrary, an exposure of this area is ugly. That's the opposite of beauty. The beauty in this area is the intensity of the bond in its privacy. Again, it's hard to go into detail, but Jewish law in this area is a law of tremendous intensity but tremendous modesty. If it appears that there's any prudishness in this area, it's because we don't express these things externally. That we have a tradition of no, no expression of affection, physical affection between man and woman, husband and wife, in, in any exposed or public forum. This is not because we don't believe in intensity or connection. But because, on the contrary, just as detailed and just as intense are our laws of menstrual separation, are our laws of marital togetherness. Again, this is a subject that needs to be discussed, and this is not the place to, 
to go into it, it needs to be gone into, the way to go into it properly is men by themselves, just before marriage, day before, no more than that. And even then it's not understood until a good few painful weeks later. And then you need to get together again, discuss it again, and that's what has to be done. And women have to get together on their own. Women don't have to discuss just before marriage. Women are subject to the same problems that plague the, the male of the species. And therefore women, are, women have the, the sensitivity and the maturity to discuss this at any time. And therefore that's what they need to, go, need to do, they need to get together on their own in the, in the, in the modesty of that uh, convocation and have somebody who, a woman who understands these things to, to learn these things. It's like any other area of Torah. It has uh, probably more holiness than any other area. Today, of course, it's so, today this area is so beaten down and so devoid of holiness because of the way it's been stripped and <coughs> sold and, and ruined. Today, what yeah, one is considered lucky to be more or less normal in this area. Right? Today, we don't look for holiness in this area because today a person is more or less normal and functioning normally with a little sort of aspiration towards something higher that's a massive achievement in this generation no question about that but in Jewish tradition it was always the area that was used as the springboard for the greatest holiness there's no question about that our sources are tremendously eloquent about the, about the Kedusha about the elevation that this area can achieve in, in higher generations so our concept here is that it's the due modesty that this area is given. It's the intense privacy of this area that is its beauty. And that means we're talking about privacy and loyalty. That means it's given intensely, but no place where it shouldn't be. Joseph, Yosef, is the one, try and understand this, he's the one who represents these two poles in the most extreme way. What does his life teach us? Joseph, Yosef, I'm sorry. He's the one who spent a year when he was 17 in Potiphar's house, right, which is the arch model of seduction. That means this woman tried to seduce him, the, 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 the Torah makes it clear and the rabbinic sources go into extreme detail about the method she used to try to seduce him. Almost inhuman, a level of almost inhu impossibility for a young man to resist. And for a year, he, he, he withstood that, that temptation. In fact, not only that, but he, he, you have to understand, he, he withstood this temptation in a way that was completely unnatural. I mean, even in the last critical moment where she literally attacked him and the only way he could escape was by, was by to leave without his clothes I mean she grabbed onto his his cloak his clothing and his only option was to flee the house without his clothes and of course when she started screaming and yelling and accusing him of what he had not done he was found like that in the most ultimately incriminating fashion and of course he was lucky to escape with his life but the Rambam uses that as an example of Kiddush Hashem it's a remarkable thing it's a remarkable thing when the Rambam, the Maimonides, brings the laws of sanctifying Hashem's name, sanctifying God's name, by a Jew behaving the way a Jew should behave. So normally we understand that Kiddush Hashem is you behave in a way where people see you in an incredibly righteous way. Kiddush Hashem means that in difficult circumstances with your back to the wall and all against you, you come through and you, you do what you should do. It's tremendous admiration, tremendous heroism. But you have to understand the example the Rambam gives of a Kiddush Hashem is the example of a person who did what was right when everybody, but every single person around, except possibly she, knew that he was guilty. Because he was caught in the most ultimately incriminating of circumstances. In fact, our commentaries ask why he didn't go back in and take his clothes. Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he go back in and take his clothes and put them on? Why did he allow himself to be found in that? He needs explanation. But he didn't. And therefore, he was caught, as you say, red-handed. There was no question of his guilt. And, and, and the whole world of Egypt must have looked at him with incredible ultimate scorn and he was jailed and lucky not to be killed for that. That experience of doing what you know is right in circumstances like that where not where people see that you did what is right but where you, have, you know that what you're doing is going to be seen as completely wrong but you in your heart know you're the only one who knows that it's right. But of course that goes back to that's what Judaism is. Judaism is one person standing against the world. Did you see the comment of the... Uh, this is not politics. Okay. This is not politics at all. And we keep away from that. We don't lower Torah to those terms. But, did you see the comment <laughs> of the head of one of the... And again, we won't even mention names here. But let us just say an international convocation of nations <laughs> who... <laughs> 
get together for the purposes that they get together, their head said, did you hear what he said recently? Can the whole world be wrong and Israel be right? Is it possible? Everybody says they're wrong and they're the only ones who say they're right. It's clear they're wrong. How can the whole world be wrong and they be right? That was the question. That was the question. Self, a rhetorical, self-answered, self-evident question. Can the whole world be right? Can the whole world be right and the Jews be... Can the whole world be wrong and the Jews be right? And the answer is that's exactly what Judaism is. But that's exactly what we are. The whole world is 100% wrong. And we are right. That's not yet talking about which political element among us and which policies and, and, and who is and who isn't. But Judaism, you have to know, stands on that principle. Avram Abraham was one who stood against the whole world. Avram Avri means he stood on one side and the whole world stood on the other side. That's exactly who we are. That's not a question for us. That is the definition of who we are. That is our definition. You're not a Jew unless you can stand against the world. Now, what kind of question is that? On the contrary, if the whole world unanimously agrees on one thing, the Jew can be reliably convinced that what they're saying is wrong. It's inevitable. That's the definition. The, the, when they argue among themselves, it gets complicated. Maybe. But when they all agree unanimously, especially when they all agree that we're wrong, what better assumption could you have? What better surety could you have then? That's what he did. He stood against... That's a Kiddush Hashem. Kiddush Hashem means to be doing what you know you have to be doing, even when it looks completely wrong, which is what you have to do. So here you have an individual who... That, that was his area of temptation. That was his area of conquest. And he resisted that. The sages say that he resisted it so in such a, uh, such a um, transcendent fashion that because of him, the Jewish people who, who descended to Egypt, yes, that means the next generation, <coughs> his contemporaries, his children, the, tri the tribes, the 70 people who constituted the original quorum itself, the Jewish people who descended to Egypt, they spent 210 years in slavery in Egypt, and during 210 years of slavery in Egypt, there was not one act of immorality among the Jewish people. Do you know what that means? You're talking, you have to understand, 210 years of slavery to the Egyptians who were, I can't translate the words in Hebrew because there's no, there's no delicate way to say it in English. But Egypt is called in our sources, Arab Vas Do you know what that means? That means, I'll say it in a nice way in English, the nakedness of the world. That, that, it doesn't mean that, it means much more, much more crude. In, in, a, in Torah there are no crude words, they're all euphemisms. But what the euphemism here means is much more than nakedness. Ervas Haaretz, that's what Egypt is called. It was the land of the ultimate experience of sensual immorality. And the Jewish people were slaves in that land, and they were a people without a Torah. They had not yet been jailed and bonded into being the Jewish people, gone out of Egypt with the Torah commanding us about morality and adultery. And, uh, they haven't been given yet. That means it was only the purity of their tradition, that's all. Just the concept of what it means to be a Jew. The, yeah, that is, that is, that's our defining characteristic supposed to be. They lasted 210 years in that slavery, where they were beaten down, they were all beaten into idolatrous ways, and they were, they were mm. tortured as slaves. And during all that time, can you imagine what it means for a slave? Imagine a Jewish woman in that circumstance, who could be a little friendly to an Egyptian, a little friendly. Can you imagine what she could gain? For her, for a family. You're talking about slavery, torture, a holocaust type of torture. They, they, it was literally a holocaust. They destroyed Jewish children en masse. There was not one incident of immorality. And the Talmud says there was, there was one which was accidental. And it's recorded to teach you this point. One Jewish woman only, whose, whose husband, Egyptian impersonated her husband when it was dark and she didn't know and ended up a child being born from this Egyptian man. And her guilt was only that, that she was a little too forward in a, in a friendliness of greeting people, that's all. And so she was noticed. But the only one, could you imagine, the only one in 210 years, the Jewish people kept themselves on a level where there was not one act of... Can you imagine what that means? I mean, if, if you want to imagine what it means, can you compare it to the, any situation that you're familiar with? How many seconds go by? Let, let's put it that way now. Today there's nothing, today is not even a temptation, it's already been, it's been given, never mind sold, it's been given before it's even been asked. But that's how, that's how the Jewish people were. And that quality of being able to hold strong in that dimension of modesty and privacy was because of what Joseph, just because of Yosef, because of what he went through for a year. Of course, Yosef was a father. That means what he puts into his children 
is an expression of his essence, and his essence is that purity. And therefore he represents for us this power of being able to resist in this area and purify this area. You know, you have to understand what's fascinating is that Yosef, Joseph, unlike any other biblical character, is transitional between... Uh, there's a depth here. Joseph is transitional between the generation of the fathers and the generation of the sons. You know, he was a son of Yaakov, right? He was a son of Yaakov. Abine. You know, in the seven... In the, in the placing of the seven great characters, so Joseph is the one whose position shimmers between two positions. Are you familiar with this problem, this issue? <laughs> you have Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov. And then by rights who should come next chronologically is, ya- is Yosef, right? He was a son of Yaakov. And later you have Moshe, Aaron and Dobit in chronological order. And there is in fact one ordering of the seven like that. But there's another one in which you have Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov. Then you have Moshe and Aaron. And then you have Yosef, which is really out of order. You're placing him down near the bottom of the system where production or the birth of a child is about to happen, even though he was a son of... Do, do, do you see the issue? And the reason is because Yosef is the one who is father and son. He is the transition. Do you remember what he said? Evan, Avan, Ben. Yosef is the one who is transitional between father and son. That is what covenant is. That is what bris means. He is the son because he's the son of Yaakov, so he's one of the tribes. Joseph is one of the twelve tribes. On the other hand, his two sons are tribes. Ephraim and Manasseh. There's no one else like that. Again, there are different ways we count the tribes, the twelve tribes, right? Yes? You've seen the depiction of the, you know, the, tr- the Shvatim? Oh. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Yosef, have here Yosef. And not Ephraim and Manasseh. Right? That's one way of counting. But there's another way of counting, differently, where instead of counting Yosef, you count his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, each has a tribe. That means he has sometimes the status of being a father, like Yaakov, because just like Yaakov, his children are Shvatim, are tribes, and sometimes he's counted as one of the Shvatim, as a son. He shimmers between these two positions. He is both. His father and son. And he has two qualities. He is that duality. What are his two qualities? His two qualities are giving completely and ultimately with full intensity and never giving in the wrong place at all. Which is the defining characteristic of the beauty and the morality and the intensity of the giving itself. You know, you see this very beautifully. He, first of all, he is the one who becomes a father. Even though, even though he's in the generation of the sons, he's elevated to the position of being able to give birth to two tribes. And yet, he doesn't give in the wrong place at all. He resists the temptation or the seduction not in a way that Probably in all of history, no one, ever else, no one else ever managed in that, in that, to that degree. So he is at one and the same time the distance from immorality and the correct production in the marital sense. You see this, by the way, in the names of his two children. Ephraim, al shem pri The word Ephraim is based on pri, meaning fruit. And Menashe is based on the Hebrew word meaning to keep away from. Nashani, that means to, yeah, to, to keep away from what's wrong. The, two, the, two, the names of the two children, there are these two forces. You look a bit further, you see that Joseph is synonymous with beauty. You see, our notion of beauty is not the sordid, exposed variety. Our notion of beauty is that same issue of bonding of opposites with great intensity, but in the the correct modesty and isolation and privacy. And, and, and isolation in the sense of, of privacy and isolation in the sense of exclusivity. Think about it for a moment. Joseph, who represents the conquest of the male female, the purity of the male female area, is the only male in the Torah who is described as having a woman's beauty. Joseph. Right? He's a male, and the Torah's description of him is the kind of beauty, Yefas, yeah, he was. Beautiful of form and, and appearance. He was, but those words are the words that women are described with. Yofi, Yofi, beauty. The Gemara says that women are beauty. Ain't Isha El Illinois, the Gemara says. A woman is beauty. That's where beauty is. That needs full explanation in its own right. But he is a man, and yet he's described as having a woman's beauty. <coughs> And the reason, the concept here, <coughs> is that real beauty is the bonding of these two forces in correct exclusivity. You see it many ways in Torah, in Nach, if you look in Nach, 
you have another man. Who's the man in Tanakh? Who's described as having tremendous beauty? No? Abshalom. 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 And he, he had a tremendous beauty and he was a Nazir. A Nazir is a person who keeps himself away from any possible contact with physicality. There's a case in the Talmud, if you want to complete the picture. A woman called Ima Shalom, she's the wife of one of the Tanoim. She had children of inexpressible beauty. When they asked her what was her merit, that her children achieved that incredible... And the answer she gave, again, I'm not going into the details, but the answer she gave was that she kept herself completely, what you call Gadurmi Erva, that means fenced off from any suggestion of any possible immorality, but to an extreme degree. You see that in Torah thinking, it's again, it's hard for us to understand this, because the way they sell, what they sell out there, is exposure and licentiousness and sensuous exposure and stimulation. They sell that as beauty. On the contrary, it's exactly what they do. But our concept of beauty, beauty is the putting together of male and female in exactly the right way. That's exactly the opposite of the way the, the world sells that. The only, the only mystery, the only question about the world is why women stand for it. That's, that's beyond all understanding. They claim to be feminists. Yes, that, that's, yeah. Claim to be feminists, to be upset about these things, and they tolerate what's put up on the, on the billboards. Women? Sold like horse meat? A woman with any sense, married to an ex advertising executive who does that, doesn't go home at night. She doesn't go home. What, what are you going home to? <sighs> anyway, the point is that the you know that Joseph, Yosef, is gematria, the same numerical value. Joseph is Tzion. 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 Zion. Not the political version. Spiritual version. Zion. What is Tzion? What does it mean? Tzion is the center of the world. Tzion means the place of the base of Mikdash. In Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, where the temple stands. That's called Tzion. And the Apostle says, Tzion Michlal Yofi. Tzion Michlal Yofi. It means the totality of beauty is Yerushalayim. In fact, the Talmud says that ten measures of beauty came down to the world. Jerusalem took nine. You know, it always means whenever we have a, a Talmud, whenever the Gemara says that ten measures of something came down to the world and a particular entity took nine, it means the rest is charity. One in ten is always charity. It's Doka, Misa. <coughs> so Yerushalayim took ten measures. Ten measures of beauty. Yerushalayim took nine. It means all the beauty. There's a handout, charitable handout to any other place in the world that has any vestige of beauty. That's all. It's like the Gemara says that ten measures of talking came down to the world and a certain group of people took nine, we're not going to mention who, and left those of us who are not part of that contingent one-tenth. Ten measures of immorality came down to the world and a particular nation took nine, again without mentioning which one. But... That's what it says. Ten measures of beauty came to Yerushalayim, to the world, and Yerushalayim took nine. Tzion Michlal Yofi. Tzion, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, that place, that's the same numerical equivalent in Hebrew as Yosef, Joseph. And the matter says, whatever happened to Yo Yosef happened to Tzion. Whatever happened to Tzion happened to Yosef. Without the details, the concept is, what is Yerushalayim? What is the place of the Beis HaMikdash? Is it not the ultimate place of contact between male and female? What stands, what is in the Beis HaMikdash? The place with the ultimate male, namely Hashem, Means the ult meets the ultimate female, which is the world. Us, as his woman, as it were, the world. Not in that ultimate meeting of production, which is the ultimate fruit, which is the product of the world. <coughs> That's what Yushalayim is. The Talmud says that Yushalayim is the place, the Nashki, Shmaya Aradadi, where heaven and earth kiss. That's the place where heaven and earth kiss. There's nothing metaphorical or poetic in the Talmud. If that's what it says, there's a, there's a meaning to that. Kissing is always that intimate connection. That's what it is. That's why the mouth is always the organ of connection. Since it's the organ of kissing, which is that function of connection, speech, which is connection between people, among other forms of connection, and eating. Eating is the connection in body and soul. When you eat, you provide the energy that holds the Lashama in the body. Yushalayim is the place of eating. Well, don't you have in the temple the same three functions? What are the three functions of the Besamikdash? You have there heaven and earth kiss, you have there speech, 
Where is the voice of Hashem heard from? From between the two golden kruvim sneaking out? At the place of eating, you have there the sacrifices. The korbanas, what is the function of the sacrifices? That's where the world eats, so to speak. The neshama, the shechina, the, the soul of the world, is kept invested in the world by the food. The laws of the sacrifices are the laws of food. You know, it's called shulchan gavur, the sacrifice, the altar, the mizbech. It's called shulchan gavur, Hashem's table, as it were. It's korbani lachmi, my sacrifice is my bread. And they all have to be brought with salt and they the meals. The world eats there, right? As it were. It means that's where the food energy is put in that keeps the ultimate soul in the ultimate body, the, namely the, the shrine, the presence, that, that, that divine emanation in the world. Yerushalayim is that place of meeting, and the kiss is that expression. What is the center of the temple? The Kodesh Kodoshim. The chamber, the inner chamber of sanctity, and what is in there? Well, what exactly is in there? The point of ultimate meeting between Hashem and us. And what exactly is in there? Two golden images. And the Talmud says they're male and female. Nu'urim zebezeh. That means two golden f- male and female images intertwined. And that's why on, the, on, the, on certain times in the year they would roll the curtain and the Jewish people would come to see Ruhi baschem lifnei Come and see how beloved you are by Hashem. That you come and you look at, you see the closeness between Him and us represented in these miraculous because they were inanimate objects, right? But they intertwined themselves. That's why they say the Romans the Romans humiliated the Jewish people when they destroyed the temple by dragging that through the streets. The Romans, in order to humiliate the Jewish people, when they destroyed the temple, they took the Kruvim, they took these two golden, pure, they were pure, the faces and faces of children. That kind of love. Kruv, Kruv, you see, Kruv in English means cherub. But Kruv, the Gemara says, means Karavia, means like a child. That's what it means. Why do you think they depict angels in, in a secular a non-Jewish world as little as, as children. Because that's what a kruv is. It's that purity. But they were embraced. And the, more the, yeah, the sources tell us clearly that when our relationship with Hashem was the way it should have been, then those two images are locked in an embrace. And when our relationship was not the way it should have been, they turned away from each other. At the time of the destruction, the Romans dragged this image through the streets of these two male and female images intertwined. To humiliate the Jewish people, look what they worship. Look what's in their holiest sanctum. You would think it is, who knows what? It's a golden image. Graven image of these. And the obvious question is, if these two, if, 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 if when our relationship was bad, so to speak, with Hashem, these two faced away from each other, what were they doing embracing at, during the time of the destruction? The time of the destruction was there ever a time of greater distance between Hashem and us than when the temple is destroyed. You know what the temple being destroyed means? It's where a home between husband and wife is shattered. That's what it means. That's what it is, ultimate apparent divorce and at that moment they locked in an embrace and the answer is obvious the answer is obvious in the privacy of the Kurdish Kedoshim you go into that inner chamber then when the relationship is the way it should be they locked in an embrace and when it's not they turn away but when exposed to the Roman world exposed to that world out there that world which makes a religion out of immorality so relative to that world they're locked in an embrace that means our relationship with him even at the worst of moments Relative, relative to the world of completely secular and atheistic and negative values. So even at the worst of times, what's revealed to them, relative to their world, that's an embrace. And there are other meanings as well. What is the meaning of beauty? Let's understand, let's go a little bit further. What is the meaning of beauty in this area? Sion Michlal Yofi. It's a place of beauty and it has the same numerical equivalent as Yosef Joseph. What does this mean? Do you know what beauty is? Beauty is when opposites bond into one. Beauty means, yofi is where two opposite things bond. Beauty is not where you take something and you add more. That's not beautiful, it's just more. Beauty is where two opposite things come together to form a harmony in which each is more of what it was before and yet melts into the opposite. You know, beauty exists only in the higher senses. <coughs> beauty exists only in the senses that connect to spirituality. Only in the eyes and ears. You know, in the spiritual world, the, the organs... There's a devolution of the organs as you move from the highest all the way down from the, from the top where the child's skull is open and the brain pulsates and makes a connection where the tefillin of a man reopen that connection all the way down to the feet which are the place of death where the serpent bites and the poison is injected and as you move down you go through layers of decreasing, decreasing order of sanctity of condition. That's how the body operates. Many mysteries and wonderful things here. But when you move from eyes to ears in those two organs <coughs> you have beauty. Below those organs, you don't have beauty. In smell, taste, and touch, you only have pleasure. You don't have beauty. 
There's no such thing as beauty in a smell. It's not appropriate. There's no beauty in a taste. There can be a harmonious mixing of elements in the taste dimension which produces a sensation which is pleasurable. But the concept of aesthetics, of beauty, of aesthetics, is only in sight and sound. In sight, when you see, when you see opposites, sweeping opposites, hills and mountains and valleys, or extreme opposites that are harmoniously, as in nature they always are, they are harmoniously mixed or juxtaposed. There's something that each gives to its opposite by being put next to it, which is greater than it had on its own. Even though they're opposites, they don't clash, they complement. <laughs> and in sound, it's the same thing. There's beauty also, aesthetic beauty also in sound. And music is correctly... Yet, yeah, when the notes are put together wrongly, nothing could be worse. Nothing could be more jarring. But when the notes are put together correctly, the fact that they're different notes put together in the correct relationship, either at the same time as chords or different times as melody... But when those elements are put together correctly, perfectly, then the fact that they're different brings out the, the unity of the fact that they're different and yet put together. It's an indescribable thing. In modern, in modern physics, when they come across these things, they call them emergent phenomena. They don't have any word for it. They call it emergent. It means where the sum of the parts is greater than the parts. That's what music is. Mu- music is the ultimate emergent phenomenon. Music is where you put parts together that on their own are nothing. That, incidentally, is what the 49 days are all about. The Sphere of is nothing other than that. That is the ultimate moving to beauty, which is Torah, on the 50th day. The 50th transcends the 49, like the music transcends the notes. That's exactly what it is. In music, you take the seven notes of the scale, you put them together correctly, you don't get seven notes, you get a thing called music. You have to be, something wrong with you if you don't understand that. You, you, if, you don't, if you don't respond to that, you are so insensitive that it's not help for you. There's no way to express that in words, because you can't, you can't talk about that. You have to hear it. But that's what music is. Music is when you put the notes together correctly, the result is something that's not the notes, it's more than the notes. Which is really absurd. It's absurd. You put a plink with a plonk with a plink, and if you play them, you know, if you play them with a space in between, you get a plonk and a plink and a plonk. But if you play them in the right relationship, you get music. Remarkable thing. It's absurd. That's called beauty. When the things are put together and they're different, and they shouldn't have any connection, and yet because they're different, they put together correctly, you get something more than, than either of the parts, and more than the sum. That happens in sight and sound. That is, that's the notion, that's the nature of beauty. And that's what male and female are supposed to be. Correctly put together, it's the opposite, the ultimate opposite in the world is male and female. There's no greater opposite than that. <coughs> the pole of maleness, and the pole of femaleness. Male means being unlimited. That's what male means. Male energy is unlimited energy. Male seed is created by the million and billion. Female seed created one at a time only. I'll never forget the experience of, during training at medical school, having to dissect the embryo of a human. You're talking about a, a human being as yet unborn. And you see in the, in the ovaries, you see in those organs that become the seed-forming organs. It's a remarkable thing. They both come from the same place. They both develop from the kidneys. They break off and they descend to the parts of the body where they end up. Both the same tissue. And in the female, in the male, the same tissue becomes a tissue that produces seed by the million and billion. And in the female, the same organ becomes a factory in which there are so few that you can count every last one. And every month of a fertile cycle, you'll see only one is given out. And one meets billions. Maleness is an overproduction, an electric, a tremendous overabundance of energy. And femaleness is the making specific, the bringing it down to the one thing that can and must be. Nothing could be more opposite. The word, we spoke about zakhar in Hebrew, meaning memory. Zakhar also the gematria, the, the numerical equivalent of the word zakhar is blessing, bracha. What's the concept of bracha? Multiplicity. The concept, the Jewish concept of blessing means it gets more. That whatever you have, and the more that it becomes, it's more than that. Yet more. That's bracha. You know what Baruch Atah Hashem means? It doesn't mean you, God, are blessed. It means you are the source of this thing that puts more into this than there was before. That's what a bracha is. It brings amplification. That's what a bracha is. Tia bracha bekrizu. You're allowed to walk up to your, your thing before you measure and you're, you're allowed to daven that there'll be a bracha in this produce. It means more than there was before. That's what a bracha is. Bracha means more. That's what it means. You know, if you walk down to your storehouse, you're allowed to pray, you're allowed to daven, before you've counted it, that there should be more than there is. 
It's allowed to do it. Not called a tefillah shab. It's not called an improper prayer. Once you've opened the door and seen how much, you're not allowed. That's ridiculous. You can't ask for a miracle. You can't ask for a finite amount to be more than it is. You can't do that. But before you've seen what there is, you can ask for more. Why? Because if it's a miracle, then it's hidden that it could happen. Why? Because we have a principle, That's a principle that a blessing only inheres in something that's hidden from the eye. When it's hidden, then a blessing could take place. As soon as it's revealed, made finite, exposed, you see how much it is, then, you can't, then it can't increase. Been limited. Once I once heard a young yeshiva student, talented young man, I once heard him ask one of the great Torah sages of this generation, he once asked him why it's forbidden to pray that a boy, that a pregnancy should be a particular sex. You know, they're not allowed to do that. You can't pray when a woman's pregnant. It's called a tefillah shav. You can't pray that the child should be either a boy or a girl. Why not? Because if she's pregnant, it already is a boy or a girl. You can't... Before pregnancy, you can daven for a boy or for a girl. But once pregnancy is already there, and once the child is already formed as boy or girl, then you can't ask that it should be a boy or a girl, because it is already. So this young man, you hear the question, you hear this. So this young man asked this learned rabbi, he said to him, but why? It's hidden. It's hidden. If it's as yet hidden, why can't you ask for it to change? You hear the question? And the answer is because it's not, we're not talking about something that's hidden. We're talking about the sugi of brocha. Brocha means blessing. Blessing means more. You can ask for that which you don't see to be more. But A to change to B or B to change to A. That's a change. That's not more. That's not called brocha. The pregnancy is a brocha. Whether it's a boy or a girl. You're not... Yeah. needs more thought and needs... needs to be gone into halakhically. There's uh, interesting questions here, but... Bracha means to make it more. Zachar means making more. That's what it means. That's what maleness is. And femaleness means making finite. The Hebrew word for female means nekeva. You know what nekeva means in Hebrew? It means to make finite. To give an edge. To set bounds. Nakva aschar chaylai vetana. Fix your wages and I'll pay you. Give me a figure. Give me a number. That's female. Male, no number. Whatever the number is, it's more and more and more and more. Of course, without a woman, it's nothing. It's all dead and gone and useless. It's just the overproduction of hopeful energy. That's all the male is. Without a woman to bring him down and give him a place and make him real. That's the curse of maleness. The curse of maleness is that without a woman, it's all this energy that's blasted into nothingness, which is death. What's the curse of femaleness? The word nekeva in Hebrew also means a curse. The word for female in Hebrew means a curse. You know why? Because our, con our concept of curse is where it's not anymore. It's only fixed. So if it's only what it is and it can't be more, it's not blessed. The beauty of being a woman, the blessing in woman, is to be able to give the thing a finite bound so that it's real and it grows and it's alive. The curse side of the female is to freeze it solid so it can't grow. The skill and art of being a woman is to take that speck of almost nothing that is the male spark and to fan it to a flame. Not to freeze it solid, but to give it enough tangible reality so it becomes a real thing in the world and then it must tear itself away. Yeah. It must be born and then it must go on and it must leave again later. It has to become, just to give it enough of its reality so that it's not frozen and concrete and hard, but it has enough reality to be its own. They're opposite poles. And when you put them together, you put them together, you have the absurd result, completely absurd result. And instead of being magnetic opposites, they bond. How do they bond? How do they bond? Because you put glue in. The glue is that which bonds them. And in the, the perhaps the oldest image, that's the most famous image of this, the most, perhaps the most, one of the most beautiful in our classic sources, that's why the word ish and isha in Hebrew, can't put it any better than this, the word ish and isha, man and woman, they have the same letters. Ish and Isha are the same letters, except in the male name is a Yud, which is always the male, always the male letter. It means ten, which has the ten, uh, has to be oh, again studied in detail. But the Yud is always the male letter, and the Hebrew, the female, the woman, Isha has a hay instead, which is always the female letter. Feminine words in Hebrew they take a female ending, you put a hay on the end. So she has the hay. So when you put Ish and Isha together, you get the Yud, and the hay together spells Hashem's name. You have a divine name. When man and woman come together and there is a divine essence between them, that means there's a spirituality that transcends the two of them, which is where they lock in. 
Then you have Isha and Isha, and the harmony between them is Hashem's name. But if you have a marriage between man and woman, you take Hashem out of that, then you all, do, all you're left with is Aleph and Shin, Aleph and Shin, fire and fire, and they consume each other. Bond opposites, you need something else. You can't put opposites together. Then they tear apart. Anyway, what did we study this evening? We studied the idea, the very basic idea, the most basic idea, the idea that lies behind this generation's temptations. The pre-Messianic age, as we move down to the final of the seven, we move down to the Messianic David. Who is David? We'll have to speak about it maybe. Next week we can go into detail. Who is David? David is the seventh. David is the seventh of those seven points that are brought to the world. He is mystically the seventh note of the seven notes of the scale. What is David called in our literature? Neim Zmiros Yisrael, the beautiful singer. Music comes with him because he's the seventh note. He completes the scale. That's the next quality. But that's born. That messianic reality is born as the totality of all seven only when the six are there. And the sixth of them is to take all the five and not giving anything else, not adding anything of its own, not subtracting, giving all of it and loyally in the right place and not in the wrong place. That's what it is. To put it bluntly, if you want to have a share in the messianic redemption, you want to help bring that about, then you have to look to purity in this area. Look to purity. If you're a woman, you have to start projecting your being a woman in a modest fashion. You have to project a womanly beauty in a, in a way that is beauty, that is spiritual. When you project your womanly beauty in a way that makes you look like a horse, not going to help the Mashiach. But it's when you take a beauty that could be looked at that way and you project it in an angelic fashion. <coughs> That's what a woman must teach. Who was the mother of the Jewish people? Sarah. Sarah. Abraham Avinu's wife. Sarah. She had many names. She had names. One of her names is Yiska. You know that? Thomas says her name was Yiska. Because the word Yiska is based on the word Sacha. Ki akol sochin beyafia. Because everybody, akol sochin beyafia. Everybody could see through her beauty. The word Soche in Hebrew means to see, but has unusual nuance. It means to see through. To see through. Like the word Sukkah. What's a Sukkah? What's a Sukkah? You see through the roof. It's flimsy. You see through. That's the idea of a Sukkah. It's to see Hashem. Not to see the concrete roof of your palace and your fortress. To see what really protects you. See through the roof. I call Sochin Biyaf. Everybody could see through. What does it mean to see through a woman's beauty? What does that mean? It means when you looked at her, you saw Hashem. How did she manage that? She was a, a stru- stupendously beautiful woman. She wasn't beautiful in a spiritual way. She was beautiful in a way that was as, as, as earthy and as, as... How do we know that? Because the Egyptians were moved when they saw her. And the Egyptians were as immoral as they come. And they were ready to kill her husband for her. And she was so incredibly beauty in that way that they wanted to be ready to kill her husband, take her for their king. So we knew she had that kind of beauty. And yet she conducted herself and she projected herself in the, way, in the world in a way that when you looked at her you saw an angel. You saw Hashem. Of course, if you're an Egyptian, there's no hope for you. If you're an Egyptian, you can look at an angel and then you see a horse too. Of course, there's no hope for the eyes that, that will not see. No, nothing you can do about that. Uh, I see it's getting late, so... Let's wrap it up. This is the pre-Messianic ordeal. This is the problem. If you want to take a practical message from these deeper ideas, that it is just like the Egyptian exile was a temptation of immorality, which was the beginning of all exile. Then it follows that the end of all exile, which is ours, goes back to the same point of foundation. It's the same point of temptation. Today, today, this, today that's all there is. That is all there is today. It's not occasional. Today, that's all there is. It's all there is today. Today, the culture of the world goes around us. That's all there is. There is nothing else. There's nothing else. Even if it's something like power or money, it's only to spend on this. It's only to spend on this. What is it for? It's either to spend on it or spend on something else that impresses this so that it can then
can be the highest echelons of political leadership. What is it used for? How did you get to this? It's what the libraries are filled with. Needs thought that. Why? Why this area? Why this type of pleasure? Why is this more fundamental? Why the libraries of the world not filled with books on how to, you know, eat things that taste good? Or why? The, needs thought. Perhaps another time we can discuss that. But this is what it is. This is the culture. And today there's no avoiding it. Today if you don't buy a magazine and you don't buy a newspaper, and of course you wouldn't dream of having a television. So you can't drive down the street, even if you avoid all those things. Even if you avoid those things, you can't. You avoid all the media, let's say. You never go to a movie. You would dream of doing that. You wouldn't have a television. You buy no newspapers. Let's say. Let's say. But you can't walk on the street. They're not even ashamed to show in 60 foot, you know, 84, I don't know how big they are, to show the kind of things that they tell their children that shouldn't be exposed. They themselves aren't even ashamed to go against their own. Anyway. And therefore, the message is, yes, the Jewish purity, what it means is, is modesty in this area. That doesn't mean there's not intensity. This is exactly where intensity is generated. This is exactly where the production, where the real fruit, the real meaning is generated. Meaning in a relationship, generation of the future. But it has to be done in this way. Tzion Michlal Yofi. That's our concept of beauty. Our concept of beauty is the putting together of these polar opposites in such a way that they come together meaningfully, and yet there's the dignity that when you see them, you see spirituality. Okay, we'll stop there.